Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 20. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremias, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples, that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. There are words in this passage which have led to painful differences and divisions among Christians. Men have striven and contended about their meaning till they have lost sight of all charity, and yet failed to carry conviction to one another's minds. Let it suffice us to glance briefly at the controverted words, and then to pass on to more practical lessons. What then are we to understand when we read that remarkable saying of our Lord's, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Does it mean that the Apostle Peter himself was to be the foundation on which Christ's church was to be built? Such an interpretation, to say the least, appears exceedingly improbable. To speak of an erring, fallible child of Adam as the foundation of the spiritual temple is very unlike the ordinary language of Scripture. Above all, no reason can be given why our Lord should not have said, I will build my church upon thee, if such had been his meaning, instead of saying, I will build my church upon this rock. The true meaning of the rock in this passage appears to be the truth of our Lord's Messiahship and divinity, which Peter had just confessed. It is as though our Lord had said, Thou art rightly called by the name Peter, or stone, for thou hast confessed that mighty truth, on which, as on a rock, I will build my church. Note, there is nothing modern or peculiarly Protestant in the view here maintained. It was held by Chrysostom long ago. It was taught by Ferris, a Roman Catholic preacher of the Franciscan order, at Mayence in the 16th century, in his homilies on St. Matthew. It may be well to remark in this place that it is a complete delusion to suppose that the scriptures can be interpreted according to the unanimous consent of the fathers. There is no such unanimous consent. It is a mere high-sounding phrase, utterly destitute of any foundation in facts. The fathers disagree as much in explaining scripture as Whitby and Gill and Matthew Henry, and Oily, and Mant. End of note. But what are we to understand when we read the promise which our Lord makes to Peter, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven? Do these words mean that the right of admitting souls to heaven was to be placed in Peter's hands? The idea is preposterous. Such an office is the special prerogative of Christ himself. Revelations chapter 1, verse 18. Do the words mean that Peter was to have any primacy or superiority over the rest of the apostles? There is not the slightest proof that such a meaning was attached to the words in the New Testament times, or that Peter had any rank or dignity above the rest of the twelve. The true meaning of the promise to Peter appears to be that he was to have the special privilege of first opening the door of salvation, both to the Jews and Gentiles. This was fulfilled to the letter when he preached on the day of Pentecost to the Jews, and visited the Gentile Cornelius in his own house. On each occasion he used the keys, and threw open the door of faith. And of this he seems to have been sensible himself. God, he says, made choice among us, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel, and believe. Acts chapter 15, verse 7. Finally, what are we to understand when we read the words, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Does this mean that the Apostle Peter was to have any power of forgiving sins and absolving sinners? Such an idea is derogatory to Christ's special office as our great high priest. It is a power which we never find Peter or any of the Apostles once exercising. They always refer men to Christ. The true meaning of this promise appears to be that Peter and his brethren, the Apostles, were to be specially commissioned to teach with authority the way of salvation. As the Old Testament priest declared authoritatively whose leprosy was cleansed, so the apostles were appointed to declare and pronounce authoritatively whose sins were forgiven. 
Beside this, they were to be specially inspired to lay down rules and regulations for the guidance of the church on disputed questions. Some things they were to bind or forbid, others they were to loose or allow. The decision of the council at Jerusalem that the Gentiles need not be circumcised was one example of the exercise of this power. Acts chapter 16, verse 19. But it was a commission specially confined to the apostles. In discharging it, they had no successors. With them it began, and with them it expired. We will leave these controverted words here. Enough, perhaps, has been set upon them for our personal edification. Let us only remember that, in whatever sense men take them, they have nothing to do with the Church of Rome. Let us now turn our attention to points which more immediately concern our own souls. In the first place, let us admire the noble confession which the Apostle Peter makes in this passage. He says, in reply to our Lord's question, Whom say ye that I am? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. At first sight a careless reader may see nothing very remarkable in these words of the Apostle. He may think it extraordinary that they should call forth such strong commendation from our Lord. But such thoughts arise from ignorance and inconsideration. Men forget that it is a widely different thing to believe in Christ's divine mission when we dwell in the midst of professing Christians, and to believe in it when we dwell in the midst of hardened and unbelieving Jews. The glory of Peter's confession lies in this, that he made it when few were with Christ and many against him. He made it when the rulers of his own nation, the scribes, and priests, and Pharisees, were all opposed to his master. He made it when our Lord was in the form of a servant, without wealth, without royal dignity, without any visible marks of a king. To make such a confession at such a time required great faith and great decision of character. The confession itself, as Brentius says, was an epitome of all Christianity, and a compendium of true doctrine about religion. Therefore it was that our Lord said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. We shall do well to copy that hearty zeal and affection which Peter here displayed. We are perhaps too much disposed to underrate this holy man because of his occasional instability and his thrice-repeated denial of his Lord. This is a great mistake. With all his faults, Peter was a true-hearted, fervent, single-minded servant of Christ. With all his imperfections, he has given us a pattern that many Christians would do wisely to follow. Zeal like his may have its ebbs and flows, and sometimes lack steadiness of purpose. Zeal like his may be ill-directed and sometimes make sad mistakes. But zeal like his is not to be despised. It awakens the sleeping. It stirs the sluggish. It provokes others to exertion. Anything is better than sluggishness, lukewarmness, and torpor in the Church of Christ. Happy would it have been for Christendom had there been more Christians like Peter and Martin Luther, and fewer like Erasmus. In the next place, let us take care to understand what our Lord means when he speaks of his church. The church which Jesus promises to build upon a rock is the blessed company of all faithful people. It is not the visible church of any one nation or country or place. It is the whole body of believers of every age and tongue and people. It is a church composed of all who are washed in Christ's blood, clothed in Christ's righteousness, renewed by Christ's spirit, joined to Christ by faith, and epistles of Christ in life. It is a church of which every member is baptized with the Holy Ghost, and is really and truly holy. It is a church which is one body. All who belong to it are of one heart and one mind, hold the same truths, and believe the same doctrines as necessary to salvation. It is a church which has only one head. That head is Jesus Christ himself. He is the head of the body. Let us beware of mistakes on this subject. Few words are so much misunderstood as the word church. A few mistakes have so much injured the cause of pure religion. Ignorance on this part has been a fertile source of bigotry, sectarianism, and persecution. Men have wrangled and contended about Episcopal, Presbyterian, and Independent churches, as if it were needful to salvation to belong to some particular party, and as if, belonging to that party, we must of course belong to Christ. And all this time they have lost sight of the one true church, outside of which there is no salvation at all. It will matter nothing, at the last day, where we have worshipped, if we are not found members of the true church of God's elect. In the last place, let us mark the glorious promises which our Lord makes to his church. He says, The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The meaning of this promise is, that the power of Satan shall never destroy the people of Christ. He that brought sin and death into the first creation, by tempting Eve, shall never bring ruin into the new creation by overthrowing believers. 
the mystical body of Christ shall never perish or decay. Though often persecuted, afflicted, distressed, and brought low, it shall never come to an end. It shall outlive the wrath of pharaohs and the Roman emperors. Visible churches, like Ephesus, may come to nothing, but the true church never dies. Like the bush that Moses saw, it may burn, but it shall not be consumed. Every member of it shall be brought safe to glory. In spite of falls, failures, and shortcomings, in spite of the world, the flesh, and the devil, no member of the true church shall ever be cast away. John chapter 10 and verse 28.